I think we're live. There we go. Uh, can you hear me, everybody there? Um, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I've got to hide this little banner. There you go. So welcome. Today we're going to look at this. I'm going to show you real quick because I think it looks pretty cool. Um, nope, not that, but we're going to do a live demo. But we're going to do that. I am going to be showing you how I built this really cool cart. And, you know, it all started because I bought this kit. And, I mean, I have pictures of this. But I bought this kit for my D&D diorama. It's right over there. And um, I thought it would be great because I wanted this for a wine cart. You know, integral to the story for this diorama is this wine cart that Rue, uh, his name is Rupert Avery. I, man, I bet, I hope it's Avery. Uh, it's been so many years since I read the book, but he has this wine cart. And what he does is he's he's like coming down to, to Crondor and he's trying to sell wine and, and it's a complete flop, but he spends all his money on wine and not as an afterthought, he knew he needed a cart but he didn't hardly have any any money for the cart. So he bought a used cart that was pretty beat up. His father, again, in the storyline, and I even have pictures of it. Well, not pictures, but the book. Let me see if I can figure this out. Um, um, here's the book, Rise of a Merchant Prince. And what happens is he comes down to Crondor where the diorama is set. And he tries to start his own business. Goes to a complete flop. But then he starts working at Barrett's Coffee House, which, let me go back, in, in the left-hand side of the picture there, the diorama, that's Barrett's Coffee House. So I really wanted to build this little cart. I've got it up here. And when I bought the one, I thought, great. But let me go back to the pictures here. We're going to get back to this in a minute. This is the issue. When I got down here and I saw these, these springs, I was like, wait a minute. Did they have those springs in like 600, 700? You know, this is, so this is supposed to be, first off, it's an alien world. And so you're not going to, you're not going to, oh, I'm sorry. I'm like not, I'm missing some comments here from folks. Um, hello, John. John is here. Scott is here. Hello, everybody. I've got to say hi to everybody. I'm so sorry, people. I, I just dove into this thing because I've been so excited. I, I missed last week because my computer, and then I got into that kind of a mood. And so I I, I couldn't do our, our deal last week. It was very upset by it, and, and, and it all compounded into me not doing my show, which, you know, this is the 88th show. I've missed one before, and that was when I first started doing the show on Fridays when um, I had a prior commitment. I, I had somebody scheduled was, was coming over could, to be in the shop, uh, Stephen Robinson, my friend. And so that's the only other time that I've missed a Friday. And last week we missed a Friday. So it was a kind of a big deal. Well, it was a big deal for me. Uh, but thank you so much, everybody, for coming back in. And, and I really appreciate you coming in. So I do want to say hello to everybody. So Paul was here right off, uh, uh, you know, at the start. Thank you very much for coming in, Paul. I really appreciate it. Stephen Kessel was here really early on, too. Before the show started, these two gentlemen were there. So that was really, really cool. Thank you so much. Jordy, hello, Will. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, thank you for coming in. I really appreciate it. Scott, how are you, sir? I, I hope you're good down there. Um, we're actually having a, 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 a furry family problem. Um, one of our indoor cats, Cooper, is not doing so great. He's 17. And so maybe a little bit more about that at the end of the show. But yeah, so um, Scott, I know you were having some problems with one of your Huskies and, and, and I hope everything's going okay, but I, I, you know, I know how that goes. If you need to, you know, we can link up this weekend or next week or something like that. And, you know, maybe do a live uh, deal uh, and see how things are going. So keep that in mind, Scott. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm there with you. Um, so thanks very much for coming on, Scott. 
Uh, Scott and I have talked, and, and John, as a matter of fact, um, John Robick, thank you so much. Um, it's raining cats and dogs there. You guys are getting that that onward thrust or whatever the heck they're calling it, that that uh, 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 river, something. Um, we got the wind part of it. So we had this bomb cyclone and then like this, this, this river of, of water is just assailing Northern California and Oregon. So it has been really a heck of a week. We had power outages. Um, there are still over a hundred thousand people in the Pacific Northwest without uh, power. Gosh, I, I, I hope that comes back folks. Um, a good friend of mine, a, a, a friend that, that has been on the show, um, they had a, a, a tree hit their house. Ah, so man, folks, be careful out there. It is just it, this, these weather storms and all this kind of stuff is, is happening right now. It's very, very scary. Oh, excuse me. I'm talking myself dry. Hobby Art, thank you very much. Uh, Bill, how are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. And thank you very much for, for uh, coming in and saying hello today. Miniatures and Small Scale, thank you and very much for coming in. Um, miniatures and Small Scale and Hobby Art, do I know you guys? Miniatures and Small Scale sounds so familiar. Hobby Art, you also sound very familiar from maybe some comments online. Thank you very much for coming in. I really, really appreciate that. So where in the heck was I? I think I was talking about um, the springs on this cart. So I'm building a cart and I find out this cart really isn't going to work for what I want for my D&D diorama. It's supposed to be like six or eight hundred, maybe a thousand, you know, AD. But in the book, it's 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 an alien world. So you know, it's not, it's not real. So it, it could have had these things, but I didn't want to do it. And I, I kind of wanted to build a cart anyway. And, and I'm glad I did because I think it looks phenomenal. And that's what I want to show you today. I want to show you how we built the cart. Number one, um, some of the very, and it's, and it's super simple. Um, and then how I weathered it. I think the weathering came out really great. The weathering allows you to take Real wood, you know, if you have the capability of producing these kind of things, and I'm, I'm going to show you that, um, to build this thing. And then I used a wire wheel to weather it. And, and man, it came out great. But there's also our secret ebonizing uh, vinegar. It is a vinegar solution that's been used in woodworking and model building for years. Uh, railroaders know of this thing for years. And what it is, is it darkens wood. That's why it's called ebonizing. It darkens the wood, makes it almost jet black, dependent on how much tannin is in the wood. So there are some woods that have higher tannins, other woods that have lower tannins. And, and so by applying this, this solution, we're going to talk a little bit more about it, how to make it and all that kind of stuff. Um, you can darken wood. And specifically with, with walnut, which is what I used, it, it works phenomenal. So we're going to do the whole process. I've got my, let me see if the top down is working. There's the top down. So I got it really tight in there. So we're going to see how to do it. This is my little starter that you're going to see. And um, I think it'll be kind of a cool, you know, demo later on today. So let's, let's try to get back on track. I'm, I'm very good at getting off track. Um, so uh, I changed my name. Okay. Um, American jeans. Oh, very cool. That that's wonderful, Christian. I like hobby art. And that's a great name. Um, remember, we were talking about that. So I love it. Thank you very much. Great name, by the way. Um, and then uh Scott says, sounds great, Bill. Thanks very much, Scott. You know, I think it would be fun to connect because I, I know what that's like, and 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 we're kind of going through it right now. Uh, miniatures is small. It's miniatures that sounds funny. I'm from Sweden. Oh, thank you very much for coming on. Um, I really appreciate you, you know, because it's pretty late in Sweden now. It's in the evening. Uh, it is noon here, Pacific, uh, on the West Coast of the United States. So what we're going to talk about is this little cart that I made. And from the start, I want you to, to know it is very simple to build. It is very, and we're going to go through the whole thing through pictures and things like that. And I really want to take my time with the um, 
weathering because I believe anybody can achieve this weathering with very, very common materials. And so I, I, I hope you enjoy that. So um, I think I would want to start because I'm going to back up my slides and stuff like that. But I want to start and show you a video. It's about three minutes long of the whole process of building the cart. Uh, it's, it's set to music and all that kind of stuff. It's a video that I dropped last Saturday. And so we're going to watch that together. And then we'll be able to reference, I think, much more clear. It'll give you a timeline as to where things are happening in process. So I'm going to go ahead and play that right now. And then, um, yeah, we'll take a look at it and, and, and look at it afterwards. So thanks very much for, for watching that. Um, I, I think that was kind of meant to be like a grounding to show you the whole process. You know, I, I started with this kit that the wheels were great. I, you know, I looked at, at, at old cart wheels, old wagon wheels, horse-drawn carts and things like that. And pardon me, those were perfect. And for myself, I think I've tried to build them before and boy, it's really difficult. And I was trying to build like three inch size cartwheels, you know, so it was really, really difficult to build them yourself. So I used those from the original kit. And then I just started on this path of, of, of building my own cart. Um, so let's take a look at that. I want to say hi to a couple of folks. Uh, 
and then uh, it looks so realistic. Awesome work. Thanks very much. And and a lot of it has to do with that vinegar solution. So let's let's get into this and and we'll take a look at it. Uh, my name and name. Let's go like that. Oops. While we were watching that, I uh, I painted those things black so that they'll be ready to age. On the cart here, you see a lot of metal. And, you know, on the, on that, that with the traces, the, the hookups, you know, for the, the horse and, and things like that, I thought that was something that I really wanted to, you know, uh, uh, continue with. I didn't want to try to recreate that. I found a lot of stuff online that, um, you know, helped, you know, determine, is this really a viable cart for that time? And one of the things that I found was uh, a lot of it had this, this, um, Oh, I'm sorry. Wrong picture. A lot of them had this um, splayed side, this leaned over at an angle side in Europe, you know, the early ones. I don't know if that was for hay or whatever, but it lent itself really, really specifically to all the ones that I saw. Uh, I think it would also allow you to carry a heck of a lot more. So I, I went with that design. Um, I tried to bring the pictures in, but they were like, they didn't want to come in, you know, because of copyright or something like that. So I'm sorry. If you look up medieval cart, there are actually quite a few examples. And I did try to, you know, follow those as much as possible. So the very first thing that I did, uh, I got to swap this over, was make the frame. And, and, and the frames were typically very large beams. You know, they weren't weren't engineered so much. It was just like, you know, I built it like that. It failed, build it bigger, you know, that kind of engineering. That's kind of the engineering I kind of do. And so there was this cross piece member that was the the, the basis for the frame because that's the, the rear of it. Um, these uh, straps, these white straps, that's paper. And, you know, when I was doing this, um, Scott McLeod that's on here was, you know, we were talking, he's like, wow, what kind of paper is that? We're going to talk about that, Scott. Finally, I'll I'll talk about the paper because it's just heavy paper, uh, but it works really well. So uh, I put those straps on there. Those are going to be iron bands. Um, and then that's two pieces of wood. And now when I'm doing this, I'm actually doing joinery. So I'll show you that in a minute. Now, this is just a little thin piece of brass that I took over to my grinder and I kind of sharpened one end. I sharpened what will be the other end and then I cut it off. And then that's what you saw me hammering, making into this little U-shaped, um, um, I don't know what to call it. This is the basis for the actual suspension in the back. And, and this is a real thing. You know, this was in the examples that I saw online. If you've got a cart and, and everything is all solid and stuff, and you go over, over uneven terrain, you're going to lose traction and you're going to, you know, that, that other wheel that dips down, if there's not a little bit of play in that rear end, like this one has, what will happen is, is one will go up in the air and you transfer all the weight onto one wheel. It's not that you lose traction. Like today we think about it in a vehicle because you've got rubber tires and losing traction is bad. It's the fact that you're putting all that weight on one wheel and that can break that wheel. So you, you know, I mean, there's other reasons, certainly, but that's part of the thing that I read about. So in making this work, I needed to have some pivot. That's what this is. Hammered that in, and then I have my pivot. I did a little bit of a bevel, as you can see, so that there's room for that axle that I built next to, to actually work on there. Now, how it's attached is also very odd. It's very loose. It's, it's not so much attached, but here is the axle, the separate axle piece that moves back and forth. And there you can see it after I put the banding, which will be the, the metallic or steel bands on it um, and then mounted it back. Um, here's a good look at how the front of that is. And that's, that's real. That's what I saw. These were these, you know, there was a, like a real heavy brace that was attached up to that central beam underneath the cart on the examples that I saw. And this stuff is all blacksmith stuff. You know, they're, they're hand hammering this stuff. This is not like, Oh, give me a little bit of that and cut off a piece and I'll form this. You know, they're hamming this stuff and, 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 
you know, smelting the ore and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, um, that's how that's attached underneath. And then I'm going to take and put some, uh, I'll put some of these little bolts and you can get these. These are Meng, uh, M-E-N-G. Uh, and, and I found these a long time ago. There was a, a, a gentleman that used these, uh, Rick Taylor from the IPMS Seattle group. And um, he introduced me to these. And they're fantastic. Meng makes these. There's bolts. There's nuts. There's rivets. There's all kinds of stuff. The rivets are probably the hardest to get. I've used all mine, and I'm out of rivets. But um, there's lots of stuff that you can find online. I typically have to buy it on eBay because you can find it overseas. But getting in the in the U.S. is a little bit hard. But those, I love those bolts. I did see that uh, Studson Studio, I got to meet him uh, last or earlier this year. It was really, really neat at the IPMS uh, show. And um, Christian, who's on today, Hobby Art, um, that's the, the, the first, uh, was that the first time we met Christian face-to-face? -face? No, I think we met at the in February. Anyway, see, I'm tangenting again. The whole point is, there are lots of little things that you can use for bolts, for rivet heads and stuff like that. If you can't find these, go to your Michaels, go to your craft stores. There's stuff out there. Um, you just want something that is repetitive so that you can use the same thing. If it's different stuff, it, it won't look right. Okay, so um, but, uh, but he, second. Yeah, thanks uh, very much, Christian. Uh, he said it was at the second one that we met. So you put those on there, and then I also put them here. Now, you'll notice there's some that aren't on a strap, and, and what that is is basically it's an old-style washer. When, you know, you were putting this stuff on, when you're actually, um, you know, using these straps, they didn't have a nut and bolt. What they did was they punched a hole through the strap part, and on the other side, they had, you know, the piece of steel went through. And where that piece of steel went through, you had to peen the end. Well, you couldn't do that just against wood. You had to have another piece of steel there with a hole in it, a washer. But they didn't make them round back then. They just took a squared piece of steel, chopped it, punched a hole through it, stuck it on there. And then they peened the end of that against it. And that drew everything together and made it a really, really good uh, hold. Um, so your blacksmiths were also building carts and building the fixtures and the, the, the wagon wheels and all that kind of stuff. So that stuff was all from there. This can simulate that, um, I think, pretty nicely. So I made a bunch of those, put them on there. And then I needed to see, and, and this is a little bit, it looks very simple, but I think it's a bigger deal than it looks like. I needed to make sure, because these wheels are different size, Okay, the, the, the front and the back. We'll see better pictures of it later. I need to make sure that the darn thing was going to be level. So this is, you know, don't forget this. If you're building one yourself, you need to make sure you level this thing as you go forward. Uh, I almost forgot. I was just like, oh, here we go now. Let's make the front end. And I'm like, wait a minute. So make sure you do this part. So now here's the front end. Now, this is a traditional front end, and it was really funky. I did, again, find this online, and, and, and more pictures here I'll show you in, in clear. But um, all this is joinery. I'm not just gluing stuff together, so I'm actually doing joining. But this is the front end. And, and what it would do is it would give you leverage in the rear, that back kind of long slider bar would go up underneath the central pillar like this of the cart with a pivot point there. And then that would allow it to turn and not the, the cart would not turn over. You know, you wouldn't, you because you, you could get that if you turn too far. So this would limit how far it would turn, but it would also keep that tongue level. They also didn't have a loose tongue back then. The tongue was rigid. It, it went straight out. So um, the horse's traces and, and, and connections and stuff were a, a little different back then. So that is the frame of the cart. Uh, and again, I, I'm not saying this is because I have a friend, John Harrison, who's an archaeologist. And it's not like we, you know, got down and said, OK, here's. Blah, blah. No, no, no. I mean, I just I'm looking at stuff online and try to figure it out. I'm like, man, it's best guess from the, the 
pictures I saw. There was no diagrams or nothing I, I located. Um, that's what I got. And I had a bunch of pictures with different angles and stuff. And of course, they're all, a couple of them are literally out in fields rotting away. But other ones were like in, in museums and stuff like that. There's one detail on this that I really wanted to add. I didn't. I, I would do it on the next one, but it's more of a, a decorative thing. So if I was doing something like Lord of the Rings or 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 something like that, I would add this and it just really made it look cool. So anyway, but I had a wonderful time building this. So if you're looking to build something like this, um, uh, I, I've got a longer video I need to put out on it. So now directly on top of that uh, T frame, if you will, I built the the base of what'll be the cart, and then the front end, which will allow it to pivot. Again, everything is built out of um, walnut. This is American walnut. Um, it's all scrap wood from a project that I did four years ago, three years ago, and uh, great stuff. Really thin pieces. And like I said, I think at the beginning of this, you can build this. I'm going to show you how, but um, I'm going to show you more how to, the pictures are going to show you how I built it. But in the longer format of it, I, I think I'm going to build something like you can download and say, hey, here's how you build it. Because it's some very simple joinery. It's some very simple tools that I have on the bench all the time, files and knives and a little saw. That's all you need. You don't need any specialized stuff. Um, it would be nice because I have my little chisels, but to make this little cart, it doesn't take a lot. And because of how I go about weathering it later, here's putting the black on what will be iron. Um, and there's a, a strip of that paper that I used, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. And then here's the underside of it, putting that on. But the whole point is you can build this whole thing once you've got this structure figured out and with a little tricks from common woodworking and, and, and what you would be able to do, you can make it sturdy enough to be able to handle the weathering that it's going to go under. Cause this thing is going to go onto a bench top, uh, wire wheel and I'm going to beat the heck out of it. So here, I don't know what these are even called. You know, I've seen them my whole life, but I don't know horses and I don't know that stuff, but there they are. Um, I thought I would wrap the ends of them with like more paper, but I didn't really need it. I, I actually just painted them later on and, and they look fine. There it is. I'm using a little blue tack with um, the, uh, the um, wheels placed over the end of the axles. And um, there's that metal bar that, that prevents it from turning too far because that would flip your cart. You know, if, the, if you got those, those wheels turned all the way parallel, uh, you, your cart could just flip right over. Here's the underside. Looking at that, there's a little clip in there that holds it. And uh, there it is from the rear. And what I'm showing you here is what is underneath that is a, a regular structure you see the the center post doesn't come all the way down to the structure there's these little cross members so i had to put those in there as well this looks really nice it's really pristine everything's on there i'm about to put some bolts on it you know more of the 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 white paper with bolts on it and stuff like that but i wanted to see how pristine it is because we're going to jack it up here pretty quick okay so there's that, and here's all the pieces that are going to get weathered. And, um, you know, I just think it's, it, it, you know, the, the, the change will be dramatic. So that's what I'm trying to show you. Here's where I was saying where I uh, took those little bolts, put it on a piece of paper, cut them off, and then I could add them, you know, as like a buck on the back of those rivets that had to be hammered in. So now it is time to take it over to the wire wheel. Now you saw that in the video, and this is how it came out of the wire wheel um i concentrated on ev on areas that i believed would get where you know right over the top boards that would you know you're, you're muscling something out um you you look at the traces you know you've got that's down near the ground uh you know that's that's part of that so that's going to get some wear i took this down pretty good and and literally i'm taking this in there and if i knock stuff off i knock stuff off i i got to repair it but a lot of stuff got knocked off. 
here, <clears throat> pardon me, there's kind of like a, a built up area um, around the corner. So I know I could go pretty hard there. And I thought, you know, if this thing is going over rough terrain and, and, and just through fields, whatever, it's just going to get kind of banged up. The underside of things, I tend to, to sometimes spend more time on than the surface. That seems odd. But I have a fascination for the underside of things because not always like on a tank or something like that. But on this, because if you do flip it over, if you do look underneath it, I don't want to lose any of that. Um, this is something that can be moved. It won't be, you know, stuck down in the diorama. It can be physically moved. So I, I needed to weather the entire thing. Uh, there's some more. See, some of that completely came off. Some of that, it's not like molding, but it's its like a grab board. Um, some of it came completely off in uh, underneath that wire wheel. Um, uh, the direction you go uh, on the wood, and, and I'm going to show a, a nice example of that here in a minute, um, you're going to get a different effect. And so when I put it all together, I thought it looked great. And then it was time to, here's the direction. I mean, you see in the middle there, there is um, quite a bit of, of where, and, and that's, I'm trying to think, dragging things out of there. And that's because the wire wheel was going with the grain. So beat the heck out of it. And then once I beat it up, uh, that's when I did the solution. And that's the first bit of dry brush. And so now, we're going to come back to these pictures, but I think we can do the top down because the top down, and I got to turn it on, but the top down is going to um, show you how I do the dry brush, how I do the different uh, washes to get those colors and, and, and where I concentrate those washes to get these colors on it. Um, one of the things, <clears throat> excuse me, that doesn't really come through in the video is the fact that when you put like water on um, wood after it's been sanded, after it's been worked by hand, whatever, and it's pretty smooth. When you put water on it, vinegar does the same thing. It raises the grain. It takes the fibers of the wood and raises it. So in the process of finishing wood, you will typically wet it. You sand it down, you wet it, you raise the grain, let it dry, and then sand it down a second time. Well, when I put the vinegar on here to get the dark tint, and now we're gonna go to the top down and, and take a look here. When I put that on here to get this dark colored tint, this was relatively smooth. Oh, sorry, I lost you. This is relatively smooth here, right? But after I put the vinegar on it, this is rougher now. And that is going to help with the kind of texture I want to get out of this because you see a little bit more of the wood fiber. So we're going to do exactly like I did in the video. And I'm going to take a little bit of this. I might even come out a little bit on this because I'm super tight. And um, it's kind of hard to see what I'm doing. Is that is that going to work? Okay. So um, I'm taking the uh, deck tan, and I wanted, I didn't want to use white. I, I wanted something close, but I didn't want to use white. And this is kind of a, 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 an off white. And I thought it looked great. So this has been um, uh, brushed with the ebonizing vinegar. And I said we'd talk about that. Ebonizing vinegar is made by taking um, four aught steel wool and that four aught steel wool, so it's like four zero zero zero, you know, zero 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 zero, four zeros. Um, that is the fineness of it. So it's the fineness, the finest steel wool that I can get commercially. You can buy like in a craft store or a hobby store. So I take that uh, steel wool put it in some vinegar and what it does is the vinegar is uh, uh, like acidic 
and it breaks down that steel wool. And by breaking it down, see, I'm getting pretty heavy on here. By breaking it down, it gets iron uh, into the vinegar. Then after it's set, maybe overnight, you take out, you know, the strain it, you take out all that um, steel wool and you're left with the solution. And when you put that solution on here, that's how we get the dark color. So um, that is, it doesn't look like much. I might even go a little bit more on that, but I, I think that's enough to show you, you know, how much um, it, it kind of grays it up. You know, it doesn't look like much on camera, but it, it maybe I'll go a little bit deeper then because it can be more. I'm looking for a grayish color, you know, but it's got to be kind of streaky. So I'm going to go pretty heavy here. I don't think it's going to mess with it bad. It's not going to like overdo it, but you've got to see it. And I'm just destroying this brush, but that's what I use this brush for. I call this a blown brush. And uh, I've had it for years and it works great. So that's that's a little bit better. So that is just the um, uh, model color Vallejo deck tan. So now I'm going to go to washes. I like to use these little, you know, it's just like a yogurt lid. And it's got these little uh, pits in here because it'll help you separate because you don't need too much of this. Uh, here is dark yellow. Just a few drops of that. This is the first one I'm going to use, which is the European Dust. And these are all Vallejo as well. I'm not sponsored by Vallejo. I just like their stuff. The, and these are also, um, you know, water-based. Uh, I've got some other Tamiya stuff, which is great. Those are like my pen washes. Okay, so what I got here is I have Rust. I'm going to see if I can get it in the camera. Uh, here we go. So I've got rust. That's dark rust wash. That's black. That's European dust. And that's dark yellow. Looks pretty green to me, but it's dark yellow. Okay. So now <clears throat> I'm looking at this like, and I've got this upside down to me, but I'm looking at this like this is the top and this is the bottom. Okay. So here's the bottom. The first thing I go in is with this European dust. And I did the entire bottom of the, um, of the cart and up the side a little bit, okay? Now I'm going to come back and use more of that later. But that is just dust. It's just road dust. Um, I can do a little bit, you know, where it's coming up here. But... And, and you're seeing reflections, but it'll dry by the time we're done. So you'll see what we're talking about. So I do a little bit of European dust. I then go in and I grab uh, the, the rust here. And I'm putting that over where I did all the iron straps. Now I'm doing it pretty heavy. I'm going to probably bring some of that back. But I no, I do want it heavy. And if I get a little bit here, it's fine. If I get it into the wood, it's totally fine because I want it to look like the rust has moved into the wood. I'm also going to take some rust and put underneath. I'm not putting rust on top. I'm putting rust underneath stuff. Remember, this is the top. This is the bottom. And underneath stuff here. Um, I may put something here like if there's a metal something here so it's streaking down. The other thing I'll do is I'll take some over here. Remember, and I did this at an angle for a reason. If, if you've got rust and, and water hitting this rust on the wood, at a point it'll, it'll, it'll overwhelm and then the, it'll streak right down. So I don't wait to go down over here. I, I do have some rust coming off here. After I've put that rust on, I come back with the black. And this black... I don't want too much. I'm going to put underneath things as well. And that's just darkening. It's bringing, you know, shadow in there. Now, the cool thing is because this is, is, is water-based, if I get too much, 
I can grab some water and I can let it bleed like all the way in and it'll just, look at that, it just blends right in. I'm gonna come back now and get a little more black. I'm gonna have a streak. I wanna have a streak here. Looks like I picked up a little rust, not a problem. And then after that's dried, I come back even with black. So you remember, I started out painting this black, then I did rust on the bolts and the straps, and then I came back with black again. There's a little bit too much black on the bottom, so I'm just taking some water. I'm gonna just draw that black away. That's fine. Um, now, I haven't used this dark yellow yet. The dark yellow is like this thing has been in a field and 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 it's been, you know, it's it's had a lot of rain and stuff like that. Again, I want to put this in shadows. I'm putting it underneath stuff. I don't necessarily want it on top of stuff. I can have that that you know dripping down a little bit, drawing it down. But I want green underneath stuff. Okay. So I am going to get a little more black here. There you go. So now we're going to let that dry a little bit. And then I'll come back because the last thing I did, I think I'm going to bring this out so I can show you the actual cart. There we go. Um, so after I had this thing, you know, the whole thing done and, and painted, you know, just this is the same exact process, I did go back and I wanted to lighten the whole thing up and I did just like an overwash of the entire thing, I, a tent or I don't know what you call it, um, of this. And I just took a wine brush. Uh, um, it's here somewhere. I took this wide brush and I just literally took the, the European dust and did the whole cart. And I really like how that came out. Now, in the pictures, it comes out, you know, quite a bit different. It, it, it seems a little dustier. It seems like there's a little bit more of that, that deck tan color. Um, it's, it's a little darker in, in real life, you know. Um, I think it's a little darker, which is perfectly fine for my purposes. Um, if it were going to be uh, like in something or under something, and, and it is kind of under a bridge where it's going to be put, um, then I could have um, white highlights a little bit more, you know, bring some that deck tan back in and do over it. But you do it to the way that you want it, you know, uh, figure out what works best for you. But that's my method. I mean, that's that's everything I did to it. That There's no holding anything back. Um, I really like it. And we're going to go back to this after it's dry and and we'll see how it's looking because then it won't reflect because of the wet. But it doesn't take long. And. I just kind of picked out all of the, the iron stuff. I picked out all of the, the different elements, the shadows, the shade, um, the whole underside, the whole belly of it. You know, you saw in the video, I flipped it over and that was the European dust, you know, and, and I didn't, I didn't really go much up on the sides. I, I did want it to kind of, kind of, you know, overlap onto the sides uh, again, when I was doing that, it was upside down, you know, I was doing like this. And so just all European dust on everything on this surface, flip it over, no European dust yet. Um, but I was doing some greens and, and some other stuff. So yeah, I, I, I think that it's fun when you, you can kind of compress down the choices. You may not do it the same way I do, but you have a way to start that you know, well, at least I can get to this point. And then for my purposes, for my taste, for my vision of what I want to look like, then you can go further. So I hope that was helpful. I've got a whole bunch of questions, so I need to go back to that. Uh, and then Mitch Smut, wagon builder was a separate craft profession. Absolutely. Um, I've seen where they had, you know, one person in a very small village and stuff like that. 
uh, Vilflicken has has that. No, Hohenfels. I'm sorry, Hohenfels had a representation of a blacksmith shop um, when I was in Germany, and um, yeah, they kind of did both. But yeah, I can see if you're producing them separate separate skills and everything. Um, do you need metal bands around the wheels? Yeah, so it does have metal bands around these wheels. I don't know that they're painted as well as they need to be, but yeah, you do have metal bands. And one of the things that I'm trying to kind of tread on here is the fact that, you know, early European London and uh, Londinium, whatever, all of that had been, you know, occupied by Romans for hundreds of years. And so a lot of the structure, a lot of the stuff comes from that. Romans had the the the, the wheel, uh, the the banded wheel, all of that kind of stuff. So that technology was quite old. The thing that got me on this little tangent was the fact that the the actual um, leaf springs weren't the same, and the, actually the shape of the cart, you know, wasn't wasn't right. So they had the wheels; those were perfect from the kit. Use those; they do have metal band. Probably need to be painted a little bit better to to to, to bring that detail out. But yeah, they do. Uh, did you seal the paint before you did the final wash? I did not. Very good point, John. And I need to do a lot of that kind of stuff. I'm not. I'm not quite done. One of the things, and and let's go back to these pictures because there's there's some fun stuff to see in these pictures. Uh, but e, we're gonna go like that here is just after the initial deck tan. You see, it looks much whiter than it actually is at this point. Um, then um, that is after I've done some of the uh, the desert yellow. That's green that makes it look that tannish color. That's not the European. That might be after the second European. But if you look at the back of the bed, uh, I'm going to try to get there. I know I have pictures of it. Son of a gun. Uh, there you go. In the back of the bed here, I was trying to put like rust or dark iron markings like you would have uh, from the barrels, the, the actual iron banding from the barrels, you know, because as they're sitting in this. So in this, I'm showing them sitting upright. Um, and, and that center high line helps keep the barrels from shifting and moving. Um, it's, it's just wide enough so that when the barrel is sitting upright in the back of this, these barrels, uh, will sit there and be held. Or if I have them like that, they're, they're not going to roll around. So yeah, bunch of, I just thought that was fun bunch of stuff that I found, you know, in, in researching it and looking at it and trying to figure that out. Um, yeah, so I, I need to do a lot more stuff to it. Getting those barrels in, I think I'm going to glue them in. And once they're glued in, just because it's going to be handled, um, or what I might do is glue them into a mass that can be removed. That sometimes works real nice. Um, that might be the way to go. If not, once all that's done, I get the final blah, blah, blah. Because I also want a tarp. There's going to be a tarp on top of it, part of it. Um, then I think I'll spray that, John, and, and, and get it nice, you know, and, and sealed in. Because right now, I can physically rub stuff off just by handling it. So, um, okay. So, I want to get back to this because I skipped something early on. And, and I think I showed you, but I want to come back to it. So, I am going to go in here to these guys and go all the way to the top because last weekend I had the group build on, on um, Sunday and it's a three hour monthly group build and Martin Holst came in and Martin and I had a, just a really nice talk. I, I believe, I, I hope he liked it. I don't know. He, when he left, he was like swearing at, no, I'm joking completely, of course. But um, Martin had a really neat, a uh, couple of pieces of software that he uses because one of the things I think about a lot is trying to take pictures of this. 
I mean, that's an evidence of what we're looking at here, right? It, it does look different in real life than maybe when I'm taking the picture. Um, and, and so trying to take a nice picture, trying to present your work, trying to get it out there in, in, in a very simple way was something that I was really interested in. I like to set up my studio. I've got like a backdrop and I've, I've got all this stuff to be able to take photos of my big dioramas and stuff like that with a backdrop. And I set up lights and all this stuff. But the thing that I noticed about Martin's photos that he posts is they're really nice. I mean, they're just great, you know? And I'm like, I asked him, I said, you know, that was one of the things, Martin, how are you taking your photos? How are you presenting your models that you do so nicely? Well, he, he showed me, so I'm going to show you these. So um, he uses Snapseed and Photo Room, neither of which I have. Snapseed is, um, that's really Android. Photo Room, though, is Android and Apple. Um uh, photo room does have a free one and it's and it's got you know different ones you can get but these are the kind of pictures that martin is able to just post and you know in my world i i overthink everything i'm thinking okay so i'm gonna need this kind of stuff and i'm gonna need that and i'm gonna have to you know on my on my desktop and all that kind of stuff and martin said no he said hold on back up i use two apps I use Snapseed, I use uh, Photo Room, whatever it is. Photo, yeah, Room. And I take the picture and it automatically blocks us all this stuff out. And the, he's doing this for me live as we're talking. So all done in his phone. He's just holding a model there. He then, this, I said, you've got this great perspective. You got the depth that's blurred in the back. You got this beautiful close up in front. How are you doing that? And he's like, I, I said, well, you know, what, what, what's your background? He's like, it's my monitor. You know, I'm just like aghast. A, a so what I would say is this, <coughs> this is the other thing, <coughs> excuse me. I'm, I'm talking myself dry. Hold on. The lettering, the, all that kind of stuff, that's the snap sheet end of it. And you can import these things in real quick. And this is just a template, you know, the P38 Lightning Fork Tails, you know, great, uh, you know, group build, just a really nice little thing. And if you're posting on social media, if you're, you know, participating with other folks, you just want to get your stuff out there to be able to just do it from your phone, man, what I mean, when I do my shorts, I do that with my phone, you know, and I take a lot of pictures with my phone while I'm building. But I've got big cameras and all this jazz going on. And, and frankly, I like the complicated part. I, I think it's fun to have all these keyboards and jazz going on. You know, it's the mad scientist thing. You know, when I was growing up, that was always a fun thing. You know, Batman in this cave had all these machines. What do they do? We have no idea, but it looked cool. I got a little bit of that in me. So I think I want to maybe get something like this. The Snapseed, it didn't look like it was available for uh, OIS or iOS or whatever for Apple. Um, but I imagine there's something comparable out there. Um, but I want to start doing that a little bit because when you're trying to get your stuff up, sometimes because of, oh, it's going to take this or I'm really having a great time building at the bench and I don't want to get up or whatever is holding you back, um, this makes it very fluid. The, I mean, he literally held up the thing, took the picture, put the stuff together, upload. And, you know, that's a really nice thing to be able to do. And, and I think to, in today's day and age, when you're working, to not interrupt your workflow to, or you're in the zone, whatever, but to be able to, you know, post something and say, hey, here's something poignant. I did this while building or whatever. I thought it was just a great thing. So thank you very much, Martin. He's not on today, but. Um, uh, but, um, uh, I, I really appreciate it. And he is on, you know, a fair amount. So thanks a lot, Martin. I really appreciate that. So I got some comments over here that I want to get, uh, seal the paint before we did that. What kind of paper? Great. Thanks very much. Cause Scott wanted to know. So 
the paper, it's just, man, I wish I had a better answer. It's just heavy paper. It is not cardstock. But if you were going to, to, to look for paper, something like that, I would go like a grade below cardstock. If you're going to print, and this is maybe where it came from, Mrs. Modelcraft, maybe have got this for us. Um, if you're going to print like um, your own greeting cards, it's it's about that thick. It doesn't have like the clay coat, you know, where it's like the super smooth. It's just regular paper, but it's heavy enough that when you cut these nice little strips of it, you know, like this, I can actually form that. Whereas, and 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 the thickness helps give it depth. You know, you can see it standing off away from the base material that you're you're uh, gluing it to. Um, I love using styrene, and you can form styrene perfectly fine. But this is so much easier to form. You know, the other thing is, is when I did this, and we'll go back to this. I've got a mess over here now, but I I want to show you this because this is dry, and it and it and it should come up a lot better and and show on the uh, the top down. But when I'm putting this paper on here, I am gluing those, those little guys down with um, uh, CA glue. So the CA glue kind of gets into that paper and hardens it. So it's not going to really fray. But even if you get real tight on paper after you've had CA glue on it and you weather it like it was metal, the paper fibers kind of add to that that texture so that it kind of looks like metal. You know, I was I was in the steel industry for 23 years. Um, I've seen a lot of steel plate come off the line. I've seen a, just a lot of raw steel plate. I've seen a lot of steel in a lot of forms. And the paper is a pretty darn good use of it. Paint it black. That was the first step. Um, I did a dry brush over it. I then did the rust color on it. Once that was dry, uh, I did black over it. Or no, yeah, I did black, did the dry brush, then I did the rust, and then I did black. And that last black, what that does is it only lets some of that rust throw sh show through. Man, I cannot talk today. But that is, is what gives it kind of that nice tone. You know, rusted steel isn't always just like this rust color. It's kind of a mixture of the steel color and the, and you get that by, by interchanging those, letting the wash dry, and then, and then putting that last coat. So works out pretty good. And, and, and I like the look of it. You can still, I, there's, no, there's no metallics in it whatsoever. You know, I used to think I got to put some metallic in there. No, you don't. You only see metallic on 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 like a treated edge, um, a nicked edge, you know, and a fresh nick or bump or chip. If it's an old chip, it's going to rust. So, you know, don't think about silver. Think about contrasting colors. And what colors are in the rust? Well, we know there's rust in rust, but there's also that dark steel colors in there too. So using those washes, I had a great time. And again, vary them to get the looks that you want, to get what works with your deal. But those are the basics. And they're listed, you know, in the video. So if you go back and look at that video, it's there. Uh, Shane, hello, Shane. It's great to see you. Seeing the wagon. Man, it blew me away. Love your attention to detail, man. Thank you very much. I, I think it... I want to be able to get as close as I can to it. And I think there is certainly a point on, on anything I build where you get close enough and it's, you know, the, the, the detail falls away and you're like, no, that doesn't look like that at all. But a couple of things I learned a long time ago, um, just because somebody mentioned it to me, not like I'm all, you know, figuring all this all up my own. Um, People see about 15% of what you see, right? I mean, I worked on this. Well, it didn't take all that long, frankly, a couple of days. But I worked on this, and so I know every little part of it. When somebody sees it, 
and they can identify it, they can recognize what you've built, they immediately are blending images from their memory of what they've seen previously to what you've actually built. They don't see what you see. Fact. They just don't. So your best course of action, if I can say it that way, is to make it as close to resemble what it is without actually over detailing it. I think sometimes you put too much detail in it. It can, it can blow it. Honestly. I mean, there's people that will argue that point and let them win. I'm okay with that. But the, the idea that I go on and, and, and John Robeck, who's on here, um, cause we've talked about this. He went to film school and all that kind of stuff. Um, the old map painters for the background, you know, they were doing that on Star Wars and all kinds of stuff. And, and the map painters, when you're looking at Obi-Wan, you know, shutting down the, the tractor beam and stuff like that so they can get away from the Death Star on that thing, that's all map painting. You know, there's a very, very small set, and the depth and all the background was a map painting. Looked as crisp as, 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 as could be. You know, it looked absolutely like this beautiful thing you know in the background and it was hand painted it was not a digital creation right um what happens is your brain sees it just like i explained already but your brain sees it it understands what it's meant to represent not exactly what it is what it's meant to represent and then your brain associates the things that are missing to create the image in your brain. And that's a much uh, closer, this is my theory, this part of it, that other stuff was fact, this is my theory. That is a much more closer relationship so you identify with it more viscerally. Um, I've seen digital backgrounds and they kind of look muddy to me because they're much more accurate. You know, you see a big picture of like the Dallas skyline, because that's a really famous one. You know, it's on TV and all that kind of stuff. This beautiful, you know, Dallas skyline or Chicago or whatever off the lake or Seattle even. And it's got all this amazing detail, but you just see a city, right? Lights popping out, you know, the things that catch your eye. But then when you look at Cloud City, you know, in Star Wars, you, you think that there's all this detail. That's your mind creating all that kind of stuff in there. And, and I play on that. Because when you look at those matte paintings, when you get close up to it, it is a splotch of paint. It is not somebody painting a window. It is a splotch of blue with a splotch of white reflecting off of it to represent a pane of glass. Okay? So there's a lot you can do with that as a diorama builder, uh, as a model painter. Um, John Harrison, my friend, who's who's a great painter, he paints his backgrounds. Um, John Robeck is a digital creator. And when he creates something digital, you know, he, he can paint it or he can do it digital. You know, you look at those backgrounds like the deserts and stuff like that. Let's say cars or something like that. You look at those. They should be faded. Your 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 eye, if if, if it's all completely crisp then you, you don't perceive any depth. If it's a little muddy, if it's a little blurred, just like Martin's picture, that's a really great idea. Let, let's go look at Martin's picture to, to illustrate my point. If I can figure out my electronicals. Um, so I want to look here to his picture here. So that looks like a great picture right but look at the background it's just amorphous shapes and colors if it was crisp it would be flat you wouldn't see depth so what i'm trying to say is when i'm doing my painting i really try to make it look like what i want it to look like and I think you're filling in that detail. Yeah, I'm paying attention to those things. I think that needs to be yellow. That needs to be, you know. And, and I will even go to the point where 
I want to kind of add some nails that have, have, you know, like the, the bolt or whatever they're using here is kind of half falling out or something like that. You know, I, I think that's just fun. So yeah, that's a minute detail, but I really try to think of, of painting that background. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to fool the eye. I'm trying to use the eye and your brain's ability to see depth. And, and, and I'm trying to give these little rooms that I'm creating, these little scenes that I'm creating, I'm trying to give them depth by artificially kind of doing a bad job of painting, I guess. You know, I, I really, you know, uh, that's, that is in my mind when I'm creating that, that image. I'm not trying to make it completely, completely dead nuts on perfect. So I, I hope that's helpful. Um, and, and that goes in line with how I think of building a diorama or building a scene or, or, or trying to construct a story about your model diorama scene, whatever you're building. I think of it in terms of a movie set. I love, uh, this is a reoccurring firm. So you have, if you've seen me ever before, chances are I've said this before, but the special features in movies are just brilliant. And I, I fell in love with them as a kid. And I will watch the special features from movies many more times than the movie that they're made about. Lord of the Rings, primarily. Um, second, really, honestly, Lord of the Rings is the first one. I used to think it was Star Wars. It's not. I've seen Star Wars certainly before. And, and, and I've absorbed as much of that as I possibly can. But the Lord of the Rings set, the extended editions that Peter Jackson and Weta put out, are remarkable. And like 10 hours, extra footage and stuff. And I watch that stuff constantly. I am absolutely fascinated because they're talking about lighting. They're talking about positioning. They're talking about depth. They're talking about all these subjects that I sound like I know about. No, I just understand it from watching the Lord of the Rings extended box sets. Like, for years now, they've been out almost 25 years. I've been watching them that long. I am I love them. I, I just because they're they're talking about a world that I'm fascinated with, trying to create a story visually, trying to create an image that you find engaging, you want to see, and you want to look further into, and 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 as as someone building it, you want to tell somebody something, you know, visually. You're 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 trying to express an idea. That's what filmmakers are doing. And I'm trying to, as much as possible, use some of those tricks in my dioramas to do that same thing. And, and you know, to the point, and, and I've said this again many times, I want to make a little video, all video, um, of a diorama of mine where it's a video. It's, it's, it's like a short story. And, and it's all that, you know, those are the sets, those are the players, those are the figures, those are the people overdubbing the words, you know, doing the whole thing. I think it would be fascinating because my fascination with film, certainly, but filmmaking, I'm always, you know, when I'm building, the funnest part is building, you know, I, I, I'm a builder. So whether I'm building a uh, diorama, the funnest part is building or building a video, the funnest part is editing. The funnest part is figuring out, you know, what the story is. The funnest part is designing that scene to tell you something and get across a story um, that makes sense. So that is the joy in it. The building part, the, the editing part, the creating part, you know, doesn't happen when it's done and it looks all pretty. All the creation happens while you're building. So that's why it's the funnest part for me. Um, but I'm, I think that's pretty much what I had. Um, but I had some other stuff I wanted to talk about. Um, next week is Thanksgiving. And so I am going to spend it with my sweetie. And uh, we're going to take the week off. Um, I, I haven't taken a vacation yet. I've missed a couple days here and there, blah, blah, blah. But since starting the channel four years ago, this will be literally the first time I take uh, a vacation. Um, I even work seven days a week. 
And I'm not like, oh boy, no. I think that's, I mean, I got into it because I, I, you know, I understood if you're starting a small business, if you're starting a YouTube channel, if you're starting this stuff, it is a grind. And it really is. And, and it's not unique to YouTube. It's any small business. You talk to any small business owners, and if you are one, you know that it is really a grind. So next week, I'm going to take off. Um, and that coincides with, with uh, Cooper, our cat. Um, he is 17, 17 and a half, and he's not doing so good. And it's just uh, so, you know. So um, we're going to be with him, and we're going to take a little time off and recharge. Um, for me, I am specifically going to be out here every day. Uh, I don't go anywhere, you know, um, but I am going to go about 10 feet over there to my woodworking bench. Um, if I ever have high stress in my life, I go to woodworking, you know, uh, something that's emotionally difficult. Um, I, I immediately go into woodworking. It's just something that I, 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 I there's a meditative state when you are a woodworker um, and you've done it for a number of years. And, and if you're not a woodworker, you might think, oh, that's bonk or whatever. But if you are a woodworker, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It allows you to uh, slow everything down and concentrate on one thing because it is such a, a basic skill, woodworking, that um, it, take, it, it, it can take everything out of your mind. And um, so I'm going to be doing a lot of that this uh this next week and so i hope you have a wonderful wonderful time uh during thanksgiving if you don't have thanksgiving um i'm uh in in your country or in your culture uh, i know that this time of year there's a lot of holiday things happening um so i i i hope you have wonderful holiday gatherings and and, and family time that's that's what we're going to do and, and uh, you know spend some time with the family um Thank you so much. Uh, I, I have some scheduled things. Um, there will not die. There will not be a live stream next week. I just I thought about it, but I listened to Mrs. MC, you know, Mrs. Modelcraft, and there will not be a live stream next week. I will be working on some very fun things, and uh, I, I think you'll like them very much. Um, my Patreon folks, I am doing that, John. We're doing our Fridays. I hope you can make it. Um, not going to do Friday next week. We're doing Friday tonight. Um, but yeah, uh, so so we'll we'll do that kind of stuff. And uh, I, I said earlier, Scott, we we can get together sometime this weekend or next week. Uh, and John, to for for next week Friday, we can do something before Friday if that would work for you. I hope I hope so. Maybe Tuesday ish. Um, and what I'm talking about, folks, I, this is not like some secret club. This is just like Patreon and friends on Patreon and stuff like that. And we get together and we go online and uh, we build and mostly we talk, but we come up with some pretty amazing ideas and, and, and it's a wonderful thing. And, and, and I have a lot of fun with it. So uh, take a look at my Patreon if you don't mind. I think we're getting pretty close to the end of it here, folks. I've got some comments here. Bah, bah, bah. Atmosphere. Um, Shane, see what blah, blah, blah. Okay, John, I was trying to get to the right comment. Sorry, folks. Um, so, John, in one sense, what you're talking about is adding atmosphere. It's scale. It's the particles in the air that blur out the even blue out objects in the distance. Absolutely, John. And, and again, John, film school and, and just smart guy all around. Um, he knows this, and and this is one of the stimulating things that 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 I I enjoy talking to other people about because you know you bring in your past experiences into dioramas. I I have some friends that build, and they build models. Okay, they are model builders, and they're darned good at it. Oh my gosh, like like national award winning and 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 and, and all of that kind of stuff. And it's neat because they're super good at it. I kind of like when somebody builds a model and then they bring other stuff into it, like another vehicle or a scene or something like that. It just brings a little bit more spice to it, you know. Um, 
instead of building a tank, why not build the tank from the movie tank, like with James Garner, you know, so it would be modern, you know, I mean, yeah, model builders do that, but I'm just saying by bringing different skill sets, bringing different knowledge into your projects, I think you bring a little bit more interest into it as well, instead of just, I'm the absolute best airplane builder, or this or that, you know what I'm saying? There's, there, there's just a little bit more spice in there. And I like that very, very much. Uh, happy Thanksgiving break. Best wishes for you. Thanks very much, Will. And, and you as well. Um, it's, it's something that's well overdue. And, you know, spending time together here at the house and stuff is, is, is going to be really, really nice. So I really, really appreciate that. Uh, Javier, th happy Thanksgiving, my friend. Thank you very much, Christian. And um, we have not done a talk in a little while. I would love to, to schedule something there too. Not this Sunday, but next Sunday, possibly. If I don't know, with there's a lot of shopping going on. So a lot of people are really busy, but I, I hope that's okay. Um, thank you very much, Stephen. I really, really appreciate it. And, and enjoy your Thanksgiving as well. Um, I love Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is a great time. It's going to be different this year, obviously, but yeah, it's, it's going to be wonderful. Awesome, John. Thank you very much. Homefront Forge. Hey, thanks, Bill. Enjoy your week. Thank you so much. And 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 I hope everybody here um, has some time. Um, if you know this, this is a time of year, just in general, that there is more stress. Um, if you've not identified that that one thing, or maybe you've got a couple of things that you have identified that really help. Lower that. Try to try to find some place for that in the next few days, in the next weeks, in the next month. Um, there's a lot of sketchy stuff going on in the world right now. But what we can do is uh, take care of ourselves, um, make sure that we feel good. You know, put some time there. Don't get frazzled. Um, give yourself a little bit of grace. I, I love that that uh, term giving yourself some grace. Um, and for me, woodworking and working on this and, and creating and thinking and doing something with my hands, um, that really, really does it. So I hope you have a wonderful one. Uh, Harvey, uh, that works for me. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Christian. I, I, I'll send that up and, and John as well. well. We'll we'll see if we can get that going next Sunday. I think that would be wonderful. Um, I hope, John, you would be available for that too. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Scott. And, and like I said, I'm going to, you know, we'll contact probably a little bit later on today. I'll try to get something out and we'll figure out the whens and the whys and the what for everybody. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And, and, and thank you for, for letting me doing this and, and, uh, you know, gosh, being in, in your home for a little bit each week. I, I, I truly appreciate that. Have a wonderful, uh, holiday. Um, try to get some rest. Try to get some of that personal time. Try to get to that thing that will wind you. And um, have a great holiday. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.